Hey guys, so this might be a surprise. Uh, um, if you have uh, seen my recent videos, obviously I took them down, but uh, my recent videos talking about how um, I converted to Eastern Orthodoxy and, and all of that, which I, I became a catechumen in the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, I fully acknowledge that there are problems in the Catholic Church. You know, it's it's you know, it's not like the 1950s anymore, or or, or, or it's not like the 1400s, right? So the Church has problems, you know, especially with this current Pope. But the more I I researched and. I took this very seriously. For months, I kept on asking Christ, if Rome is your true church, show me. You know, and I think that's a pretty re reasonable thing to ask. You know, and constantly for months, I had this thought, if the Catholic Church was truly not the true church established by Christ himself. Why would Satan, <clears throat> for the most part, only target the Roman Catholic Church? You know, in listening to exorcists and stuff like that, I learned a few things about demons. Demons do not care whether if something is big or small. What they care about is whether if that institution, that church, or that person has truth. Because, you know, if they have truth, then the devil will target them. If the Eastern Orthodox Church was, in fact, the true church, then the devil would target them. I'm not saying that he hasn't but not on the same level as the Catholics. There's so much evidence that the Masonic sects have infiltrated the Catholic Church. In fact, there are writings, even going back to Pope Pius IX, which um, was the Pope uh, during Vatican I, back in like the mid-1800s. And even his letters show that he was concerned based off of the intelligence that he got that Freemasons and homosexuals have infiltrated the Catholic Church. You know, and we see the same thing in Pope Leo XIII, St. Pope Pius X, e even all the way to Venerable Pope Pius XII. At the 15th degree of Freemasonry, they take a vow to destroy the Catholic Church and to kill the Pope. So, Constantly, I had to grapple with that question. Like, how do I make sense of this? And I had to be honest. Rome has to be the true church. But I've, you know, I've also seen some historical information, which I, I'll be sharing with you. So here we have... Uh, one saint and then a letter. Now, like, there's more, but I want to keep this video under 10 minutes. This is uh, by uh, Saint Optite. I, I can't pronounce it, I'm sorry. But he, he writes, You cannot then deny that you know that upon Peter first in the city of Rome, was bestowed the Episcopal Cathedra on which he sat, the head of all the apostles, for which reason he was called Cephas, that in this one cathedra unity should be preserved by all. Neither do the apostles proceed individually on their own, and anyone who would presume to set up another chair in opposition to that single chair would by that very fact be a schismatic. In a sinner. Recall then the origins of your chair, those of you who wish to claim for yourselves the, the title of Holy Church. Okay. 
So this saint is clearly saying that to be a Christian, you need to be in communion with Rome. Throughout the entire church, like church history, yes, Rome did fall out of communion. But notice, they rejoined back in communion because they knew that they weren't Christians unless they were in communion with the chair of Peter. Here's another letter that, like, flatly shows that Constantinople was subject to Rome. And you will have... You will have um, Orthodox apologists like Kyle J. Dyer that will go to Nicaea, I believe, Canon 4 and Canon 6, that talk about how each patriarch, basically, um, has no authority outside of their jurisdiction. Yet, when we read here, it's quite clear that Rome had authority outside its own jurisdiction. So Canon 4 and Canon 6 of Nicaea have nothing to do with papal supremacy. The fact that this was written before the East and West Schism proves that that statement that I just made is correct. I'll read this. As regards the Church of Constantinople, who can doubt that it is subject to the apostolic see. Why? Both our most religious lord, the emperor, and our brother, the bishop of Constantinople, continually acknowledge it. Uh, Book 9, letter 13. I mean, 12, I'm sorry. Letter 12. For who can be ignorant that... Excuse me. Holy Church has, has been made firm... In this, in the solidarity of the Prince of the Apostles, who derived his name from the firmness of mind, so as to be called Petros, from Petra, and to him it is said, by the voice of the truth, to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Wherefore, though there were many apostles, yet with regard to principality itself, the see of the Prince of the Apostles alone has grown strong in authority. So again, this is another example that throughout the early church, the modern day papacy, in the sense of its authority, wasn't entirely present back then, but the authority of the papal office was there. Throughout the first millennium, we can see an evolution of the understanding of, you know, of the um, of the role of the office of Saint Peter, right? Um, like iconography. For those who don't know, iconography is when you venerate icons. It's not the icon itself that you're venerating, but it's the person on the icon, whether if it's a Virgin Mary, Christ, or a saint, or um, the angels. When you venerate an icon, you're not venerating the icon itself. You are, ver- you are venerating the person on the icon, right? So iconography was not in the church for the first 500 years. That is a development of doctrine. I, I don't believe that the papacy by itself is a development of doctrine. Rather, I think the understanding of the authority of the office of St. Peter and his successes de- develop. Yeah. And as I just showed you, and that's only two, but I want to keep this, uh, this video short. There is more evidence to show that the Bishop of Rome had authority over the entire church. In fact, even Eastern Orthodox um, scholars admit that the Bishop of Rome had authority over the entire church. So how can papal supremacy not exist in the early church when most scholars, and not just that, history itself shows it? So 
I acknowledge there are problems, but from a historical basis, the Orthodox Church is far more inconsistent with the claim that the Church of the first 1,000 years was autocephalous because it was clearly a papal uh, mindset. Canon 4 and Canon 6 of Nicaea have nothing to do with papal supremacy. Nor does Canon 28 of Chalcedon. Because as we can clearly see, Rome had authority over Constantinople, and that completely violates Canon 4 and Canon 6. So unless if unless if Orthodox Christians are willing to admit that the church allowed the Bishop of Rome to overstep his boundaries, which no one would ever even make that claim, then the logical conclusion is the Bishop of Rome had authority over the entire church. And that's why I went back to the Catholic Church. You know, and that's two. Right? Um, I'll provide a good source uh, down to the description box, but um, that's why I went back to Catholicism. Because as what you, as what I have just presented t to all of you, you know, and that's only two sources. It proves papal supremacy. So, I know a lot of you might not like this, but yeah, I'm Catholic. Catholic again. I'm in the process of becoming a monk. So, um, I'm going to a monastery in a few weeks. I'll do some filming there and some pictures. It's a beautiful monastery. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the monastery where I'll live out like the rest of my days, and but that's where discernment comes in. But yeah, so that's why I I went back to Catholicism because it's the only one that's actually consistent. So. See you guys on the next one.